Hello friends and welcome to today's topic, how to become an AWS solution architect. This is a highly sought after and a rewarding career and who better to guide us than our guest, Saurav Srivastava. Saurav is a seasoned IT professional with over 18 years in this field and is currently working at Amazon Web Services as a solution architect leader. He holds a patent in cloud platform automation and is well-respected author, speaker, and a thought leader in the technology industry. He has written a book, Solution Architects Handbook, which is an excellent resource for anyone looking to pursue a career as a solution architect. So guys, sit back and listen to Saurav as he shares his insights and tips on how to become an AWS solution architect. And friends, at the last, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. So let's get started. Hey, hi, welcome, Saurav, and thanks for giving your time today, Saurav. Yeah. Thanks, Anand. Thanks for having me, and I'm glad to come to your channel and talk about the solution architect career. That's great. That's great, Saurav. So, Saurav, uh, if you allow, shall we start with our QA session? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, the very first one is like what qualifications and experience basically you typically required for or to become a solution architect? Yeah, so I would say, Karen, in the past, if you will see that when cloud was not there, and normally the career progression was people go into the software development and then they progress towards the career. And after gaining a pretty decent experience, like 10 plus year experience, they move to software architect and then enterprise architect. But cloud has changed the game. So now it is not necessary that you need to have the software development background. Any cloud has the place for everything and anyone can uh, become a solution architect based on their area of specialization. So what I have seen, and I have mentioned in my book also, you have the two category of the solution architect. One is journalist solution architect and then specialist solution architect. So journalist solution architect, uh, I will say, you know, normally uh, I have seen that lots of people from application development and software development uh, venture into that. And there you need uh, at least 200 to 300 level knowledge, uh, medium to complex level of knowledge in all the technology. And then you try to dive deep and develop the area of expertise in one area. Okay, so suppose you know the little bit of computing, little bit of networking and uh, some application de development, and then you can get into that. So first I will talk about the technical skill and then we'll go into the soft skills. And uh, from the specialist solution architect, someone is very deep into the big data. Suppose they have developed lots of things in Hadoop and uh, uh, are they uh, venture into the Power BI or, uh, or Tableau and in, in SQL queries and all those things, or they have done the data warehousing, maybe in NetEase or Teradata, they can venture into the specialist solution architect. They can become a big data solution architect and, and get into the cloud. And if they have that uh, experience from the on-premise, cloud is not that difficult. They can easily gain the skills into the Redshift, the cloud native data warehousing, or the uh, Elastic Map Reduce, which is AWS version of Hadoop. Okay, so all those things they can get. Similarly, if someone is network engineer, they can become a network solution architect. Someone is a, a very deep in security and compliances, they can become a security specialist solution architect. So all those different streams are available. From the experience wise, I will say that uh, it is recommended to have customer facing experience. So you worked with the customers directly and helping them to, uh, uh, to build the request for proposal or, uh, or uh, SOW, uh, the statement of work and build the complex architecture is most important. So you should be able to look the holistic view. And often people coming from these uh, web development background or other background might be looking one part of the uh, system. Okay, so if suppose if you are a developer, you are just looking at the dev environment or production environment, but you're pretty much focused on the coding. They are missing the larger picture which comes with you should know networking, database, and how entire system fit into one picture. 
so they can develop that skill that is not that hard because uh, you, you require to have like 200 knowledge to understand end to end system design and then application development they can have very dive deep into that from soft skill perspective yeah solution architect is the job where entire organization relied on you if what recommendation you are going to give which make my architecture future looking so you are building for the future when you build a architecture organization is expecting today might i have 10000 user but in 3 year i might go to a million user and my architecture should stand to that million users and then the technology should also be advanced so what is coming into the future what is current trend they need to be familiar with that so in amazon leadership principle uh, we uh, there is 16 leadership principle and the one stand out for the solution architect is learn and be curious so always keep learning and that's how you justify the role great uh, thanks thanks a lot sora for that okay so let's move on and uh, the second question is like what are the cloud solution architects key responsibility and task if you want to just sum up and if you can just uh, walk us through the role and responsibility how the typical day looks like uh, from the mm -hmm. cloud solution architect perspective sort of yes yes yeah so for cloud solution architect has the broad responsibility so you are looking for the different aspect of the architecture so as i mentioned there it is not just a, a one a part of module but you need to have the knowledge end to end whole things so when it comes to the cloud solution architect it may be you are internal facing where you are working within your organization to help your organization to migrate your workload in the cloud or building the cloud native application or others like if you are in the consulting organization or if you are in the cloud providers like aws then you are working with the external customers okay and helping them to uh, succeed in their cloud journey so uh, in in both aspect uh, i will say the first uh, thing is how you are building the foundation so as a solution architect you also need to make sure when you are building the architecture in cloud your team should have that skills so you need to enable your team so it, so you can create a center of excellence and and build the foundation how things work in the, into the cloud so how you are managing the server in on premise what was the mindset in the on premise that is pretty different in the cloud on, on premise is always on but in in cloud you need to uh, have the pay as you go model so i always put it into the analogy of the electricity so uh, if you are on premise you are having your own turbine and your power house and uh, you are keeping it always on and that's what it may be very costly but while it is in uh, while you are in cloud it is as good as electricity is coming your home power house is somewhere else and when you switch on the electricity then only you are paying the bill when you switch off you are not paying the bill and imagine if you would bring the same model here and you always switch it on then it is going to be costly so that mind share need to change and uh, so first thing is enable them uh, in the cloud the second is uh, when building the architecture make sure that you are using the all the services efficiently i will recommend as soon as much as possible go to serverless architecture because then you eliminate the overhead of managing the servers patching them or applying the os and all those things and uh, also you don't need to worry about the auto scaling and all those things because the serverless uh, architecture is going to take care of it and we will dive move, dive deep more on that as we move forward here and uh, when you are building this uh, uh, architecture the other things you should able to the primary task is able to drive the business value so it is not about the technology the overall the technology stand to drive the business so you should able to explain the things in such a language that business uh, user also able to understand and then you can tie up with the technical user also so you kind of bridge between the business user and technical user and it is your responsibility that how i can take the the business complexity or business value 
and tie up into the technical value proposition and implement into our architecture. So I will say th those are the key things. And then there could be a different terms either sometimes you want to, want to develop a solution, which is a rinse and repeat model. You can sell to the multiple customers. And sometimes you're building the architecture to just migrate one application to others. And that opportunity you can take to understand, do I really need this application? If it is leg legacy application, can I buy some SaaS, uh, cloud native SaaS model there? Or if it is monolithic, can I, change it to the microservice architecture. So all those decisions also you need to take in that journey. True, Saurabh. Thanks a lot for, for the detailed explanation. Okay. Now, the next one is that let's say a lot of people want to come into this role of a solution architect, but then how do you stay up to date with the latest development? Because I mean, on monthly basis, mm -hmm. we hear a lot of new different news that this development is happening and the new technologies are coming in cloud computing. So how do you stay up to date with the latest development and the technologies in the cloud computing space? Mm -hmm. So I take two approach. The first is uh, if you see all the cloud providers are like 10 to 12 certifications, right? And it's a long, uh, so it, it's a journey to take those. So normally I don't recommend sit into one go and give like a five certification. So what I do uh, every six month attempt one certification. Okay, and these certification keep, uh, uh, they, these cloud providers like AWS is keep refreshing it. Uh, so with that, you get yourself up to date and regularly touch into the model, right? If I give five certification in one go and I am not doing anything for one year, again, I will forget my knowledge will get outdated, right? So every six months attempt that. Again, the certification is not, makes you the champion, right? So it is just uh, a things which make you disciplined to continuous learning, okay? And it certainly help you to apply that knowledge in your job, okay? So if you are keep doing in every six months that discipline you are bringing in your life, like if you are spending every day, like 45 minutes to one hour, you can do that. And the second thing is, uh, what is going in current trend you can read the you can like subscribe to the their news channel okay or their blogs and they uh, like aws is continuously launching what's new and it will come to consolidated digest to you what i do actually my learning things everyone is busy in their day job and that job is also very hectic right you need 40 to 40 hours plus of work there so you need to do some time management and my style of doing time management is when I do like daily exercise, like for 45 minutes and one hour, I put some reinvent videos on the YouTube channel and just watch it, okay? So every day that knowledge is keep accumulating. I, I, or I read some article when I get some free time in between uh, the work, okay? So that's how it helps. So I will say it, it required lots of discipline and, uh, but uh, it is not the impossible things. If you just devote 45 minutes to one hour everyday learning, you are easily able to asset. There is no problem on that. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Saurabh. Okay, so I'm now going to ask you one or two questions uh, which are mostly asked in uh, interviews. And uh, this is like with respect to security. So how do you ensure security and compliance in a cloud-based solution? Yeah, so uh, I think there was a myth uh, uh, might be a five, six years ago or before that a cloud is not that secure because if the shared tenancy model, what will happen if my data will go somewhere else? But uh, I think now people understand that cloud is much more secure than on-premise, okay, because of, uh, uh, so uh, because of the model, it has worked. So suppose in, in cloud, we talked about the shared security model. So shared security model is where you offload the on-premise security to the cloud providers. Okay, so if we are talking about the AWS uh, regions and availability zone, those are the group of data centers. And then it become a AWS responsibility to make sure those data centers are physically secure. There is, there is no one 
able to enter on that, no un unauthorized person able to assess on that, right? So that physical security or the network security is, is, is their responsibility. But once it comes to the your data and application, then you have the complete independence on that. Okay, so cloud providers are not controlling that. They are saying, hey, I provided you platform, now you go and develop your application and you store your data and you are the owner of that. So in that scenario, you become a responsible for the security of your, uh, uh, your uh, application. So take an example. By default, if you will take the S3 bucket, so Amazon S3 bucket is the object storage and which is very popular to uh, host the website also because of uh, you don't need any server. If you are putting some static website or you want to create a serverless dynamic website, you can put in S3 and it, it, it charge nothing to you. Okay, rather than be spinning up a server to hold the 10 MB of data. So S3 bucket by default when AWS give you, they disable all the security things. Okay, they say that nobody can access it. And then it, but if you want to host the website on that, you, you need to make it uh, accessible to the world. Okay, and then you can make it, uh, there is various way to make it accessible by the cloud front, which is the uh, CDN network, uh, content distribution network. But, uh, uh, but this decision is on you. Do you want to make it public or you want to make it private and how you want to drive it? Same in the application prospect to how you want to expose your application to your internal user or external user, it is up to you. Okay, so I will say follow the shared security model and I will say that uh, major things is offloaded on the cloud, which, which is the major heavy lifting, securing the physical data center. Even the... The AWS data center is uh, so secure that uh, even employee don't have access to that. And you cannot find the address. Even it is military grade uh, security is, is there. It is not available in Google map and all where you can find the address. Okay, so this is very highly confidential locations are there. And they also make sure that uh, it is uh, above the floodplain or uh, ge uh, geographic location and they have the proper resiliency and disaster recovery. So that is another way you are going to secure your data there. Rather than if you are building your own data center, you have to make sure you deploy your data into multiple data center to be, uh, if something got flooded or earthquake come, then you should have your data secure. Uh, and there is several best, best practices available from the multiple layer, whether it is uh, authorization and authentication for the user access, or it is the data level access to encrypting your data or restricting the data access, uh, and then it is at the application level. So I think there are several best practices available and uh, AWS has the well-architected framework, which give the list of questionaries where you can go and, and check mark hey, all the security best practices I'm following or not. So this is on the security side. The other important uh, aspect you have asked is compliance side. So you need to have your workload as per the industry. You may need for the finance industry, PCI DSS compliance, or you need the SOC compliance. Or for the healthcare, you need HIPAA compliance. So you will see often the uh, cloud providers certify their services as per the compliance also. It means service and infrastructure is, uh, is compliant, but still if you're developing your application that you need to certify. So that difference need to be clear. And uh, again, the, you can offload some compliance things uh, related to the infrastructure and services to cloud provider and application, you can take it up and you make sure that it is certified and that's how you uh, achieve the security and compliances in cloud. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Saurav, for that detail answer. Okay, just a follow-up question on this. So how do you manage and optimize the cost of this cloud-based solution, sort of? Yes, yes. Yeah, that is very important question. As I, when I started, we talked about uh, uh, in cloud, you want to have the different mindset, right? We took the electricity uh, generation analogy and you need to understand it is pay as you go model. So the first things I advise, for anyone having the cost uh, optimization, as soon as you spin up your account, first set up the billing alert, okay? 
put hey this is my monthly budget i can spend 1000 dollar is my monthly budget and you send the billing alert say that when it reach like 500 dollar just alert me or 800 dollar just alert me so i will go and see that hey how my cost is going up and in cloud if you see especially on aws they provide the billing and cost dashboard it's a very comprehensive dashboard it will tell you which services what time how much uh, cost it is uh, taking which services is consuming more cost and not only that it give you the recommendation also so like uh, they have this cost advisor and uh, uh, which provide you okay these instances might be not utilizing much just look if you want to shut down them or these database you have spin up but it is not utilizing so those kind of recommendation also come from the trusted advisor okay provided by the uh, aws especially so so the overall idea is to have your uh, uh, I make awareness first okay how is my cost is going and understand where i am spending money now it comes to the cost optimization as you see that uh, which services is uh, taking more uh, cost then you go ahead and optimize it and as i mentioned earlier the best way to optimize cost is go serverless okay because that's where you are following the true pay as you go model so suppose uh, if you are writing a program if you'll write a program and deploy in the ec2 instance which is the uh, server provided by aws you have to keep running the uh, running the instances right and it might be uh, there is a memory and cpu is sitting idle which you are not using but if you are using the lambda uh, you are only paying for the amount you are using that particular function okay so first you can say that hey uh, if it is taking 15 seconds to compile or 10 seconds to compile or uh, you you are just paying for that after that whenever that function we utilize then you are paying for it in milliseconds okay so you see that how using the full time ec2 instance compared to using the lambda how much we are saving same like from the database if you are using the no sql dynamo db database then again it is how much read and write you are doing you are paying for it but if you will spin up the full database instances it is always on so serverless is one way to go the other is uh, you also want to make sure that you put the auto scaling so when your workload is going up uh, automatically you get the more instances but if it is going down you make sure you shut down the automatically whatever the additional workload is going there Okay, so that will also help you to optimize the cost. And again, in the well-architected framework, we have full uh, list of the best practices for the cost optimization. I have mentioned the three, three or four, which is the most important: creating the awareness, going serverless, and putting the auto scaling. But uh, there, there is very comprehensive guide is available, and I have mentioned all those in my book as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Saurabh. so friends before we move on you have to give a big thumbs up the information the way saurav is providing is priceless i would say friends so just hit a big thumbs up at least for saurav okay so let's move on i, I really loving uh, this conversation saurav you know it shows your okay. the depth which you have you know so uh, i'm really privileged okay so let's move on uh, the next question is again very important one that how do you handle the data migration to the cloud again this is a most asked interview question and people mm -hmm. still got confused with this so sort of your uh, take on that yeah so when you are migrating to data uh, is data to the cloud and data is the most important things because every things revolve around the data so there is a multiple way to handle the data okay so i i categorize the data in, into the three part okay so you have the cold data and then you have the warm data and hot data okay so cold data is uh, you, you that data is sitting no one is using but uh, you might use occasionally but you need that data because due to compliance reason or due to using the some um, for backup purpose 
and normally we used to store this data into the into the tapes and all those things okay sometimes in some nas driver tapes so those data i will see is is the bulk of data those data could be in terabytes or petabytes it was sitting from the years and uh, i think that data you can migrate to the cloud in bulk using the uh, using the device like uh, snow devices okay so like uh, aws provide the like snowmobile okay where you can uh, migrate like 10 petabyte of data in one go and this is a big uh, trailer truck like uh, uh, where you can migrate the data and then they have the snow cone where you can put 10 uh, uh, tb of data similarly they have other devices where you can put the 80 terabyte of data so these these uh, devices you will get uh, consider this as a hard disk okay big hard disk which is tamper proof and all and uh, fire proof tamper proof aws will ship to you in your data center you load like 80 terabyte 100 terabyte uh, data on that and ship it back to the aws uh, uh, wherever they will ask and they will upload the data to your account okay so this is the fastest fastest way to get the data which is cold data now the warm data is uh, something uh, which is in your database or data warehouse which you are using in day to day basis for reporting but it is not like you need the millisecond latency or immediately coming so those kind of uh, uh, data i will say uh, you can my cut over your database you can spin up into uh, the database into the cloud so suppose there you have the oracle or ms sql or postgre or mysql database into the uh, into the on premise here you can spin up the rds okay so aws relational database services and then you can use services like data migration services like dms and migrate that data from the on premise to the aws and you can uh, connect them over the vpn or over the direct connect whatever you like direct connect will give you a very high speed like uh, 10 gigabyte to 100 gigabyte dedicated fiber optics and vpn is depend upon everyone use the vpn what is the internet speed is there so that data is uh, you can use the data migration services uh, to migrate that and then comes to the uh, cdc data we say that okay change data capture that data is continuously changing and that you want to migrate so for the cdc data you have the multiple way but more managed way i see again in dms there is a both version available you can uh, both features i will say available you can migrate the cdc data which is run time transactional data as well as the warm data which is like a one time dump you are doing okay so uh, so this is the three way you can uh, do the data migration now other kind of data is also available like if you want to transfer the file you can use the sftp like secure file transfer protocol and uh, that kind of uh, data is uh, mostly used by the banking company a lot to use the sftp server so that is available and then uh, if you want to keep the backup from the cloud you can use use the gateway okay so you can use the file gateway you can use the cache gateway okay the storage gateway so that way you can also keep the continuous backup between the cloud and uh, and the on premise so i provided you few examples but uh, there are uh, multiple way to uh, do the data migration and these are the key way to do it absolutely great uh, sort of for that okay so uh, the next one is on scalability like how do you handle scalability and uh, performance issues in a cloud based solution yeah so cloud based solution i think the one thing is resolved very beautifully is the scalability part so if you are like uh, in on premise environment and uh, take example of the holiday season okay so for holiday season normally traffic grow 10x if i will take the us it is on the thanksgiving if i will take the europe it is uh, or uk it is mainly on the boxing day or if i will take the india it might be on diwali or china in their new year okay so uh, so every countries have their own uh, shopping season and these shopping season is uh, put 10x to 20x and sometime 100x traffic on the uh, on the workload so i'm talking about the e-commerce website especially so if uh, 
uh, before uh, I joining the AWS, I used to work in the e-commerce uh, platforms, and we used to plan that 10x capacity at upfront in the year. And then we buy that hardware upfront because that hardware takes somewhere three to six months to per, from purchasing to get it production ready. And those hardware is sitting whole year idle. We just use them into the Thanksgiving, like for the two to three weeks. And, uh, but we are paying the huge cost for that. What in the cloud, uh, we have these uh, unlimited resources in uh, with us. So now we don't need to do that. We just uh, put uh, for, we just predict what the workload is going throughout the uh, year. And we put the reserve instances for that. And these reserve instances I can buy upfront and then I can save like 70% cost. And once it comes to these uh, holiday season, I can add the auto scaling and auto scaling as workload will grow, as user traffic grows, start spinning up the system at, at instance. So currently if I am using, suppose the five server each with uh, 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 like 32 GB RAM and uh, 20 CPU and suddenly 10X user traffic increase, I need 160 GB RAM, 200 CPU, uh, I will get these 50 instances, this cloud will add immediately through the auto scaling. And there also I can optimize, I can have the on-demand instances. And then if there is a some job which can done later, I can use the spot instances, which is 90% cheaper than the on-demand instances. So, uh, so this is how it solved the scalability issue. Now, if you are going serverless, then you have even you don't need to worry about the auto scaling and all those things. It will scale automatically. Okay, so that uh, that uh, other approach you can take. And when it's coming to the performance, I will say scalability and performance are very close relationship. Uh, so before going into the performance, let's uh, understand the concept of uh, the high availability and fault tolerance, right? So high availability, I'm saying my system is available. It may not be performing at the 100%. Okay, so suppose if I have the uh, website deployed in the four server and I put the two server in the different uh, data center. Okay, so two server in data center A, two server in data center B. And what going to happen is, uh, uh, suppose one data center is down, but my system is still highly available, it's still available, but it is performing at 50% capacity. That is high availability. But fault tolerance is, it is 50% fault tolerance and 100% highly available. But to make 100% fault tolerance, I need eight server. Okay, so four on each, so even I need double capacity. And fault tolerance is related to the performance. Okay, so you need to have the better performance you need to have your application 100% fault tolerance and it will automatically include the high availability there. And that's what uh, cloud provides. It provides you automatic scaling. It makes sure that whatever traffic you have configured, you have always workload associated with that. And that's how it handle the performance also. The other things related to the performance, which you need to take care obviously at the application level, you need to optimize your code. You need to make sure your database has the appropriate connection open. Your database is not throttling, your application is not throttling. So that are up to you, but you have the all the resources uh, at your door to use that. So that is problem is not there, which used to be earlier. Great, uh, sort of for that detail answer. Okay, now this one is again, uh, very important one that how do you measure the success and the ROI of a cloud-based solution for a client? Because they keep on asking what mm -hmm. we'll get when we're going to implement this solution, right? So Right, sort of right. Yeah. Yeah, ROI is something uh, whenever business is uh, investing on the any new technology, they are always looking for the return on investment. And what as often that uh, misconception happen when people go start calculating the ROI, they just calculate it for their application, the code part of it or the application part of it. However, ROI in the cloud, I will say this, we call it total cost of ownership, the TCO. Uh, 
the tco you should also include the admin overhead is there right so if you imagine if you have the 20 server to manage you need the physical data center you need the power there you need the cooling you need the security okay so that part is there it's not just about the cost of your ram and cpu it's how it's about networking it's about uh, how much uh, electricity you are spending to cool off them or uh, continuously running them off the other part is how you are optimizing the resources there so now you don't need a uh, like a five network engineers there to manage those things or you don't need a, a multiple database administrator so you can optimize on that uh, uh, resource cost also so and then it comes to the cloud where people are often look oh this is my application and how i can optimize the application we talked about the cost optimization and again we take the uh, we change our mind share to pay as you go model and the serverless model and now we talk about the per second billing or some places in the millisecond okay so you see that the granularity is available i can say that hey i am going to pay uh, only for the 30 second when i am my lambda function running or my server is running okay so till that level granularity is there earlier you are talking about in the months or not in then in in the days my server is going to run for 30 days but now we are talking about the seconds and milliseconds so never uh, take the same uh, same analogy or the same mind share which you have in on prem to the cloud or uh, you have to change the entire uh, mind set there to derive the roi and also calculate the end to end cost from data center uh, bottom from the data center to up into the application and uh, and including your content distribution network the the edge locations how you are going to deploy your application to have the global reach okay so, so your application might be deployed in us but you have a uh, uh, people assessing from the australia which is like 17 hour flight have good network latency so you have the edge location where you can deploy into the uh, uh, into just a click okay so th all those costs need to calculate and that's how you calculate the total cost of ownership and uh, roi and if i will see that uh, the other things i have seen these uh, aws is, is for the aws and amazon this is business of masses so as and when uh, more and more uh, uh, people are using they are keep reducing the price if even if you look uh, the price has uh, reduced like 70 plus times in last uh, 10 to 12 years and they are not increasing the price okay as more data is coming you will see that uh, the data storage cost is reducing the compute cost is reducing so that is another benefit that you can rest assured that your cost is going to go down uh, as you optimize more and more and at, as you optimize the as cloud provider reduce the price so overall you have the opportunity to apply the continuous optimization and saving the cost it is not like uh, a one time investment and again i will take the uh, another terminology of capex versus opex so earlier the capital expenditure is more popular like you build entire data center you do the upfront capital expenditure and that is one time investment you put 10 million dollar it is gone there whether it is performing or not you get to own this but in op opex is now capex is converted to opex the operational expenses it means that it is not the one time investment cost it is the continuous investment and you have the uh, control like in 10 million dollar you are spending like might be 10000 dollar at a time so you have the control when you wanted to pull off and we knew wanted to optimize and i think current microeconomic environment definitely uh, cloud makes sense because it give you the liberty to easily optimize the cost and not live with the burden of your capex investment Thanks uh, a lot, uh, sir, for that. Okay, so now uh, I want some inside information from you, and sure. uh, I just want to know you that what does that Amazon interview process looks like? So, if you want to share us, how's it to be the part of Amazon, and you're already there, so you might have already interviewed a lot of people, you know, 
so far. So if you would just want to share some uh, tips as well, like how to crack Amazon interviews, that will be really amazing, you know, for our uh, all the viewers who are uh, looking this uh, session. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Yes, yes. So I can talk about the interview process and what uh, uh, normally uh, as, as whole Amazon or AWS look into the candidate. And uh, we are always looking to educate the people and, uh, uh, and make the uh, talent recruitment easier for us. Okay, so, uh, so if you talk about the process, uh, uh, it, it starts with the telephonic uh, uh, interview. Okay, and telephonic is just a scanning to understand, hey, you have the, uh, you have the required knowledge. Okay, which satisfy the criteria of the position. And it uh, include in terms of the solution architect, it include the uh, checking some uh, basic uh, technical knowledge and uh, experience in the designing the architecture and uh, also on the soft skills uh, and working into the critical functional, critical things like RFP, SOW, and mainly in the architecture design. And uh, sometimes you get the written exam also where we ask to definitely build uh, the architecture. We have some exercise to troubleshoot or you need to do some write up to explain uh, how you did the innovation and all those things. Okay, so written and uh, uh, telephonic interview can go hand to hand. Okay, and uh, the season has uh, taken combining both. And then when if you are able to crack that and uh, it mostly um, uh, then the main uh, on-site uh, uh, round happen and non-site you have current uh, around uh, five round of interviews there and it is mix of both technology and as well as the behavioral interview. So one thing uh, we are peculiar about is everything we tie up with our leadership principle. You can go in the uh, visit the Amazon leadership principle website and you will see that 16 leadership principles is available. Some of the key leadership principles like the ownership, okay, how you are taking the ownership or how active you are resolving the customer issue. We call it bias for action. Customer obsession is everywhere, how you are earning the trust. So earn trust is there and learn and be curious. I, I talk about most important for the solution architect role. Okay, so all the, or think big, uh, how you are taking the one solution and making sure that uh, you can rinse and repeat and uh, and make it big. So, so there is, a, uh, so th these kind of leadership principle, we always look how every day, all the, your answer tie up to that. So my advice is uh, if you are uh, looking for the uh, AWS solution architect role, then you should uh, have some five, six example or uh, seven, eight example and tie up with the leadership principles. Okay, how these examples are verifying the leadership principle. And those examples need to be in a star format. So you want to have very clear on your situation, task, action, and result. And after that, how you scaled it, right? So star plus scale, I see that, that format. And it need to be a proper data onto that, right? So if you say that, hey, I deployed the solution, I migrated solution from the cloud to the AWS, and it is doing great. Okay, so what is the definition of great, right? Does it uh, increase the performance? Okay, does it, you say that earlier the application load time was the five second, now it is taking 30 milliseconds. Or did you save the cost? Earlier the cost was like $10 million, now I saved 30% on that and it is costing $7 million. Or does it solve your scalability issues? So you are able to onboard 10,000 user. Now you can onboard 1 million user. So you need to have the very specific outcome, right? Sometimes people say, hey, this uh, application was up and running and customer was very happy. So how happy they are? Did we this do some survey like customer satisfaction and customer rated you 4.4 out of five? Okay, or what? Uh, what is the uh, NPI score? Okay, so you need to back your answer by the data, and always think about when you are answering anything, what what you have learned from that. In any project you are doing or anything in life you are doing, you always have learning. Okay, so first is how you measure the success. We talked about. 
what are the key performance indicator you measure to identify hey this is going to be success this was my baseline earlier it was uh, it was costing me like 10 million now it is costing me 8 million so 20% improvement okay so that is your kpi is there and the third is what you have learned in this process okay what is your learning lesson so so that you can continuous improve when you are coming next time then again you make sure you apply that learning lesson okay so in short that is my advice tie up with the leadership principle uh, think about the star plus scale for performance think about what the challenges you face how and what is the learning lesson and how you measure the success absolutely great uh, sarup and i just may ask you a follow up on this like if you can provide some uh, you know uh, i don't know maybe some uh, some courses some links or some websites or some other material out there like how should anyone prepare for the solution architect role at amazon so you already mentioned about what you look into the amazon interview but then how if let someone want to jump into it so what kind of preparation if anyone can do so if you can also <laughs> give some input over there sir yes yes yeah so for that i will say uh, when you are going to the uh, interview it's always about we want to learn from your experience so you will not see especially in the on site interview rounds we are asking any hypothetical question right it is always behavior based it means tell me the time when you have built a solution which is scaled across the multiple customer right something like that or tell me a time when customer has a problem and you solved it okay and uh, what was the customer response so it always learning from your experience it means that uh, i will not advise anyone to make up the things whatever you have done in real experience just explain that but yes go into the depth of it right you don't stay at high level and some resources i will say um, yeah so one things as i mentioned earlier continuous doing continuous certification that tell us you are disciplined to learn the new things and you are continuously learning again certification it not means people are champion but it means that uh, you know how to uh, how to harvest the knowledge and then apply it and and when you are do, uh, talking about that we will ask, always ask hey how you applied that knowledge in your project what you have harvested through the certification right it not just you are taking it and keeping it aside so that will give you the knowledge the second is you need to understand the practical guide and uh, from the practical perspective few things i will recommend the uh, architect uh, building the architecture i will say is the easier part optimizing it something is required more skills and that's what i say like well architecture framework you should always uh, read that and practice it create some well architecture report by yourself and try to implement it there is a well architected labs uh, uh, and you can search it well architected labs.com and uh, those are very nice labs everyone should go through that and uh, if you look at the solution architect handbook most of the things i have put there it is from my experience i have put the architecture explain the architecture and how you can optimize those architecture how to apply the devops practices okay and uh, build the ci cd pipeline so and how to apply maximum automation so all those practical guide you can get from the book okay so if you joint that knowledge that your well architected framework with the uh, reading the uh, practical combining with your practical knowledge and uh, putting the cherry on the top by learning the different architecture how to optimize that Uh, and apply the automation i think you should able to uh, do that you should uh, you should uh, be in the good position great uh, thanks sir and uh, you just mentioned about uh, your book uh, on solution architect so i know uh, which was uh, people uh, got very good response you know out of uh, reading that book so could you also tell me uh, more about that and how it can benefit our audience uh, if you can just share some some insight about your book yes yes yeah so 
actually i wrote the book lots of people were coming to me for the mentorship and uh, asking hey whatever the knowledge you have gained can you share with me so that we can also succeed in the solution architect role or kick off their career and most of the time these the request was coming from the devops engineers or the developers who wanted to come into the solution architect role or uh, people who wanted to start the solution architect journey so in 2019 i thought okay why to not write a book on that okay and then i got connected with the packet and packed publication and i put the first version of the book okay which i uh, i think i launched in the first ver- first edition back in the 2020 and uh, we got the good response and uh, then we said okay let's uh, revise it okay and uh, make it more suitable so in in uh, last year january 2022 january we launched the second edition and uh, the book is all practical guide so whatever questions i was getting over the years from the people so how we started that uh, uh, the first uh, uh, one minute let me plug in my charger because it is going to get discharged okay sorry for the interruption okay so so the one things it uh, it, start, it start with the explaining what is the solution architect roles and responsibility because that is most important to understand and what i focus more on that non functional requirement functional requirement is fine you automatically get with the business on that but non functional requirement which we discuss more like performance security scalability high availability reliability all those things are very important which solution architect should never overlook it is their primary responsibility developers can overlook they are get drawn into the uh, implementing the features then uh, then second chapter i talked about what is the different kind of roles so as i mentioned first question there are specialist role and journalist role and solution architect in the cloud for everyone it is not just for a group of people okay that's what i explain and then uh, i talked about the uh, different attribute and principle which every solution architect should know and then in chapter 6 i have put around 35 different architecture diagram and architecture patterns it include the microservice pattern monolithic pattern event driven data driven domain driven um, you can name it all kind of patterns are there okay that is a big chapter like 50 plus pages and it is all tie up with the business use cases so how you can build like e-commerce website how you can build a a, a voting application okay so all kind of uh, uh, all kind all kind of things are available there okay in that um, chapter 6 and then we talked about the rest of the chapter how to optimize these architecture what you have built okay through the security scalability cost reliability and performance and then we dive deep into the devops and uh, and devsecops so devsecops is very important uh, with it means that you need to have security in every steps so don't overlook the security ever that can make or break com- com- um, companies and then uh, i took the uh, uh, used audience to the journey to the cutting edge technology so there is a one chapter on the data engineering and machine learning dedicated chapter in iot blockchains and even i looking further in the future in 10 year i have put one chapter on the quantum computing and explaining the quantum computing in layman language because it is very complex topic and ended the book with the solution architect documentation which is important and most important the soft skill which solution architect should have so this is pretty thick book i think uh, it has good roi it is like a 600 page book with um, uh, 18 chapters and uh, it will definitely benefit uh, people who want to start their solution architect journey from understanding role to dive deep into real time architecture and understand the emerging technology trends absolutely thanks so and uh, i will put the link that book in the description as well as our very first comment tag comment so guys if you want you can purchase that book so that uh, wonderful sort of any any discount for our viewers 
Yes, yes, I will definitely get some discount for uh, for your audiences. Okay, so nice, nice. yeah, so it will be come to you soon, and then you can put in your uh, YouTube description. <laughs> Thank definitely. Thanks a lot, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I have taken you a lot of time today, sir. Uh, so yeah, any any closing thoughts for uh, aspiring solution architect who are looking for this role uh, who want to start their career in this cloud uh, space? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I will say still uh, you may feel that hey, cloud is now everywhere. Lots of people is, is coming into okay. that, but uh, this is just a starting. Okay, what we see that it is in coming year, it is going to grow exponentially. There is lots of demand in the cloud skills and uh, it is not late. And if you are looking to go into the solution architect, just build a path, uh, do some certification, read the book, and um, prepare your interview guide with the star plus scale format we talked about, and uh, just start applying. And uh, you will definitely get the call and uh, able to kick off your career. Even uh, I have no idea in the cloud, uh, if you'll ask me like seven years ago, and now I was able to develop that skill and I think anyone can do that. So I will encourage that to start your journey now. Thanks a lot, uh, Saurabh. And uh, with this thought, uh, friends, uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about becoming uh, AWS Solution Architect. We hope that you found this information valuable and helpful in pursuing your career goal. And to further support, in your journey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment on this video. Your feedback and support means a world to us. And thank you again. And we look forward to connecting you again soon. So with this thought, thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Anand. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to share my thoughts with you. Wonderful, Saurabh. And we look forward to have more sessions with you, Saurabh. Sure, sure. Anytime. So with this thought, uh, thanks Saurabh one more time and bye guys. Okay, bye.